for almost one million years, the monstrous short-faced bear stalked the North American continent. On all fours, it was six feet tall, yet it could outrun a horse. It was twice the size and much more powerful than a grizzly bear, and able to kill with one blow. Today, scientists are still trying to determine just how this mighty creature lived and what it ate. How could such a formidable predator fade into extinction? Was it the change in climate or the arrival of human hunters? Now, science and innovative technology can take us beyond the bones. We are going to bring this animal back to life 10,000 years after it left the planet. North America, 14,000 years ago. It was the end of the Ice Age, and the melting ice sheets had unlocked a landscape that provided an abundant food source for a multitude of wildlife. The continent looked like today's African Serengeti. It was teeming with mammals, herds of bison, horses, camels. Even huge mammoths roamed across the terrain. Here, the law of the land was simple. Kill or be killed. In this harsh world, one animal stood above the rest, the short-faced bear. This beast was the largest carnivorous creature to walk the earth since the days of the dinosaurs. Experts believed it could attack and kill any prey animal it wanted. Known as the short-faced or bulldog bear, it had intensely powerful jaws that gave this bear a crushing bite. Using its sharp claws and ferocious jaws, this bear was an efficient killing machine. But this massive animal was no match for an unusual geological feature in Southern California, a pool of sticky, viscous tar that was one of the most deadly animal traps ever known. The pools of tar were molten asphalt that bubbled up from thousands of feet below the Earth's surface, forming a series of small ponds that were hidden by leaves and foliage. Just two inches of tar was strong enough to totally immobilize any creature. The more the bear tried to pull itself free, the further it sank into the mire. If it was lucky, it would die of exposure and starvation within a few days. More likely, though, it would be torn apart and eaten by either dire wolves, saber-toothed cats, or lions. It was certainly a very painful death. The tar pits have provided a spectacular snapshot of life 14,000 years ago. This prehistoric graveyard of extinct Ice Age animals has resulted in one of the richest fossil sites in the world. It's known as the Rancho La Brea Tar Pits and is located in the heart of Los Angeles. Since 1913, Scientists have been unearthing the remains of thousands of animals who died there. The George Page Museum has amassed a collection of over three and a half million specimens. One of the largest collections on Earth. Here we are at the primary storage area at the George C. Page Museum, where we have thousands of saber-toothed cat and dire wolf bones. But I only have three racks of short-faced bear bones. This huge disparity in the number of recovered bones points to an important characteristic of the bear's personality. It was strangely elusive. Compared to other carnivores, Bears were never common in one locality. 
they tended to be solitary hunters that required a large expanse of open ground space. Because these bears are so rare, each and every bone provides a key to piecing together the mystery of who this creature was and just how it lived. The vast collection of Ice Age animals at Rancho La Brea paint a vivid picture of a prehistoric landscape teeming with fierce predators, all competing with the bear. There were saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, and American lions. These apex predators had an abundance of prey to hunt for, such as bison, horse, camel, and even the giant sloth. There were also humans who had migrated over the Bering Strait from Siberia to Alaska about 14,000 years ago. Experts agree that humans came in contact with short-faced bears. This means that the possibility exists that hunters and short-faced bears could have fought each other over freshly killed carcasses. While the tar pits give us the big picture, the true essence of this creature can only be found in the details. Working 3,000 miles north of the Page Museum, Dr. Paul Matthews has conducted breakthrough research on the short-faced bear. Inside his lab in the Canadian Yukon, Dr. Matthews has amassed a collection of over 3,000 bones from the short-faced bear and its contemporaries. The short-faced bear inhabited a broad swath of Western North America, from northern Alaska down to Mexico. So it's difficult to say what was the one habitat or landscape that short-faced bears inhabited. Dr. Matthews, along with most experts, agree that this bear was a nomad, and nearly the entire North American continent was its habitat. The bones left behind from the myriad of Ice Age creatures are vivid evidence that the Pleistocene era was a brutally dangerous world for any apex predator, including the bear. No kill is easy. Any potential prey can and will fight for their lives. That animal's not gonna stand there and let you just kill it. It's going to struggle. It's going to kick, it's going to try to get away. What often happens is that there are injuries that occur. If you look at Pleistocene bone assemblages, you see a higher incidence of bone breakage, bone pathology such as infections, where the animal incurred the injury but then later healed and kept on living. The closest North American relative to the short-faced bear would be its cousin, the grizzly. And while this bear may be as fierce, there are many characteristics that are very different. 14,000 years ago, the grizzly lived on the same landscape as the short-faced bear, but they weren't competitors. One, quite simply, dwarfed the other. Dr. Matthews lays out three bear skulls that tell a striking story. Well, what you're looking at here is a skull of the giant short-faced bear. Here's a skull of a fairly good-sized grizzly bear, and this is a black bear. The short-faced bear would have been about uh, 1,200 pounds. This grizzly would have been about 500, 600 pounds, and this black bear, 200 or 250 pounds. Walking on all fours, a grizzly bear is about three and a half feet tall. The short-faced bear was six feet tall. And when it stood up, this huge creature measured 11 feet. Even amongst other monsters, it stood out. A uh, short-faced bear is quite a bit larger, two to three times the size of a grizzly bear we'd see today. And the question always is why? Why such large size? Why did this bear evolve to be such a giant? Scientists theorize that the size of this bear made it a fearless hunter able to kill very large prey, unavailable to other predators. One such prey animal was the Jefferson ground sloth, an herbivore that weighed in at 2,000 pounds. Although slow moving, its massive size was protection against smaller predators like the saber-toothed cat or dire wolf. Like today's elephants on the African plains, the sloth's massive size made it difficult to kill. 
if a sloth was attacked by a short-faced bear, it would use its best defense, sheer bulk. You can visualize the sloth rising up on its hind legs to make itself appear bigger and more impressive to chase off a predator. The sloth outweighed the bear by more than 800 pounds. But once the bear stood up, they were nearly the same height. I can see these two animals rearing up, and you would have like a boxing match where they're both up there, they're swinging at each other. In terms of weaponry, this bear had a pretty amazing arsenal. Imagine the reach of these long legs and sharp claws. It would be like a boxer standing up with a super long reach. According to Greg McDonald, the sloth's best defense was to inflict damage with its long, sharp claws. The bear might be able to immobilize its prey by either slashing open their abdominal area or by crushing the sloth's shoulder with its powerful bite. When you think of how powerful its jaw was, it would have created a lot of force that could certainly, if it got a hold of an animal's limb, would break it very quickly with the, with the jaw muscles. With his shoulder broken, the sloth would be defenseless. With the potential of killing any animal on the prey menu, how do we know what the short-faced bear ate? Did it eat vegetation like its modern cousin, the grizzly? Or was it a confirmed carnivore? Now, these ancient bones become a dinner menu helping us to go on a hungry prowl with one of the world's greatest predators. During the Ice Age, a monstrous predator stalked the American landscape, the short-faced bear. This animal died out about 10,000 years ago, but its bones provide an important record for paleontologists who are now studying this magnificent creature. In a lab located in Canada's Yukon, Dr. Paul Matthews cuts into a 26,000-year-old ulna from one of these elusive predators. This bone is amazingly well-preserved. This sample, I can tell from the smell, contains over 90% of the original protein that was in the living animal. Dr. Matthews is willing to sacrifice part of this precious bone in order to perform a cutting-edge stable isotope analysis. This test will reveal the bear's diet. Was it a carnivore? Was it an herbivore? Was it an omnivore? Did it eat fish? Things like that. We can learn that kind of information from this sample. The real information about what this animal ate lies in the isotopes of carbon and nitrogen that are embedded in the bone. The bear deposited protein in its bones based on the protein it ate, which came from the animals it ate. So the first step is to use an acid wash to separate the protein from the minerals that make up the bone. A mass spectrometer then measures the isotope levels of carbon and nitrogen in the protein that's left behind. So what we found by uh, analyzing the short-faced bears is that it had a very high or elevated amount of N15, the heavy isotope. And this was a smoking gun, essentially, that told us that it was a carnivore. These isotope results are then compared to a modern-day grizzly bear, which has a mixed diet of both plants and meat. The results are clear. The short-faced bear only ate meat, a pure carnivore. More important, the isotope levels also reveal that short-faced bears had an appetite for almost every prey animal on the landscape. They would eat bison, horse, caribou, even mammoth. In looking at predator behavior, this presents an impossible scenario. There is no modern carnivore that can hunt down all those types of prey. Most predators are specialists, choosing to focus on one type of animal. The isotope levels of other Ice Age carnivores revealed that they all had a very narrow diet. For example, the saber-toothed cat primarily ate bison. This evidence presented a mystery about the bear. 
How did it capture its prey? Did it run fast? Did it chase small animals? Did it tackle big, large, ferocious animals? Just what did it do? How did it get its meat? Dr. Matthews also studied modern carnivores and calculated that the short-faced bear had to consume 35 pounds of meat a day to survive. This is more than twice the amount a lion needs. Although the short-faced bear has all the attributes of a supersized apex predator, a completely different profile of this colossal beast began to emerge. One of the problems with putting short-faced bears into the predator box is that no other predator had become this big in the past, not even close when you consider large mammals. When comparing the short-faced bear's gait to the grizzly, calculations show that the short-faced bear was slightly faster, reaching a top speed of 32 miles per hour. But the grizzly could accelerate from zero to 30 much quicker. This put the short-faced bear at a huge disadvantage when it came to hunting. If it was a super predator like the isotope tests showed, it would have to catch prey using bursts of speed, like a lion. But the bear's bone structure wasn't designed for that. It became clear that the bear couldn't chase down its kill because its long legs were not suited to make sharp turns at high speeds. We're standing in front of a reconstruction of an adult giant short-faced bear. And the main thing that stands out are these super long legs that are also very skinny. For an animal this size, these bones are very gracile or thin. Their, their diameter is not proportioned to their length for an animal that is incurring all the dynamic stresses and strains of fast running. Yet we know this bear apparently caught and ate just about everything. But its long leg bones were not strong enough to handle the dynamic force of the bear's 1,200-pound weight. Using a modern-day leg bone, Dr. Matthews illustrates why it couldn't maneuver in for the kill. This is a tibia from a large mammal, and I'm going to demonstrate the effect of uh, dynamic stress on it. This is a five-pound bag of sand, and you can see that the bone is able to support the weight of that bag all on its own. But watch what happens when we put the weight in motion, which is the effect of an animal running. So what happens with five pounds of weight when it's in motion is it becomes something more like 100 pounds of weight. And this bone isn't strong enough to handle that weight. This simulates the effect on a bone when it slams into the ground during a high-speed chase. The short-faced bear could only chase an animal like a horse in a straight line. If the horse made a sharp turn and the bear followed, it could break its leg. So when you start to piece together bits of evidence like this, uh, you start to see a different picture of this animal. What you see is an animal that's very large, it's very lanky, that can travel at moderate speeds for a long time. Dr. Matthews believes he has solved this ancient mystery. The short-faced bear evolved into its massive size not for hunting, but for intimidating other animals into giving up their hard-earned prey. Far from the ultimate predator, the bear was instead the ultimate scavenger, roaming vast areas in search of a free meal. Today, grizzlies in Yellowstone Park will follow wolf packs and then seize their prey once they've made a kill. Fourteen thousand years ago, the short-faced bear followed the same strategy. Just wait till a pack of dire wolves had run down and killed a bison. And then swoop in to steal their kill. To protect their prey, the wolves would have encircled the bear and attacked him from different angles. 
Although the wolves were willing to fight for their kill, the bear's enormous size would intimidate them. Once he stood up, he towered over them by eight feet. Five or six wolves would have been nothing compared to one short-faced bear. So if a short-faced bear came upon a pack of five wolves on a carcass, there would have been no question who would have got that carcass. It would have been the short-faced bears. The short-faced bear was a thief rather than a hunter. It was built to steal carcasses. Its sheer size not only intimidated other animals, but it had an even more important application. Its lanky structure was perfectly suited for locomotor efficiency rather than acceleration and predation. Locomotor efficiency is related to stride length. In hunting, the bear's thin legs were a disadvantage. But for efficient travel, the bear could swing these light limbs with almost no effort. This is actually a terrific gait if you're trying to reduce the effort it takes you to cover a square mile of ground. In his research, Dr. Matthews discovered the perfect animal that matched the bear stride for stride. It is one of the most efficient locomotors on Earth. You would see a lot of similarity in the way that a camel swings its legs and a short-faced bear swings its legs. It, there would be a long swinging arc of the two legs on one side with some flexing of the abdominal muscles as well to affect that swing. With the help of light legs and long tendons that store energy and then release it like a stretched rubber band, a camel can save 70% of its energy on each stride it takes. This ratio allows the lanky animal the efficiency to glide across some of the most treacherous deserts on the planet. Using other animals as an analogy, Dr. Matthews was able to calculate the bear's cruising speed at eight miles per hour, which it could maintain for hours at a time. And some of the rough calculations show that its home range would have been upwards of 300 to 500 square miles for a single animal. That's, that's just crazy. We don't find a carnivore today with a normal home range size that large. With its locomotive efficiency, the short-faced bear could easily glide across the landscape in the perpetual search for food. Most important, this meant the bear burned fewer calories in its quest to find a meal. But once the bear found a carcass, it still had to steal it. And that was where the bear would earn its place at the apex of the apex predators. 1,000 years after its extinction, the short-faced bear is still an enigma. Its size and ferocity point toward this beast being a hypercarnivore, hunting down any and all prey. But today, scientists are painting a different picture. This creature could have been a super scavenger, combing the countryside for carcasses. A compelling clue lies in South Dakota, where Dr. Larry Agenbrod and his team of paleontologists found the remains of a short-faced bear. Its presence provides an important clue in piecing together the lifestyle of this mega carnivore. The bear that we've got in here, by all of our analysis, is a prime of life male. Pretty good sized bear. The question is, why is he in here? The bear was found among the remains of 55 mammoths at one of the most spectacular fossil sites in the world. 26,000 years ago, this area was a 60-foot deep sinkhole, about half the size of a soccer field. It was fed by an underground spring. Herds of mammoth were drawn to this mini oasis where they could find food and water. Eventually, some of these behemoths became trapped in the sinkhole. In 1974, Dr. Agenbrod brought a team of scientists to investigate the site. And when they realized the importance of what they found, they decided to leave each set of mammoth bones in the exact same spot where they died. In this way, each set of bones is like a Pleistocene photograph 
that documents the last moment of the animal's life. The short-faced bear remains were discovered in 1983 in the midst of the mammoths. But this find presented a mystery. Was this short-faced bear hunting mammoths, or was there another reason why it died at the site? The sinkhole was very steep and slippery above the water level. A key clue was in just how the mammoths became trapped. Eating at the water's edge was dangerous. If they took one wrong step, they would fall into the water. Once in the sinkhole, there was no way out. The big round pads on their feet couldn't grip the slippery bank. So they stayed here till they either starved or died of exhaustion. Although the short-faced bear was gigantic, scientists believe it couldn't and wouldn't take on a mammoth. But a dying mammoth was a different proposition. Like a forensic investigator, Dr. Agenbrod carefully considered the death scene and came up with a scenario. The short-faced bear probably smelled either decaying or heard dying animals and decided he'd come in for a hot mammoth sandwich for lunch and maybe had one that was a little more alive than he anticipated. The likely death blow was inflicted by the mammoth's trunk No evidence was found of trauma to the bear's bones. But a body blow to the chest area may have put the bear out of action without leaving any broken bones. But ultimately, how the bear died remains a mystery. How would a short-faced bear find 35 pounds of meat every day? As a super scavenger, it would have needed an array of powerful tools to find food including an incredible sense of smell. This bear had uh, increased nasal opening and more surface area in the, in the bones that are inside the nose to do the smelling. So its smelling capabilities would have been much better than a brown bear's today. The grizzly bear has one of the greatest olfactory mechanisms on Earth. But the short-faced bear had a much larger nasal opening. Plus, the short-faced bear's height allowed him to stand up over 11 feet high and get his nose into the winds from far away. To get a sense of how proficient the bear's sense of smell was, we went to Bozeman, Montana. Here, Troy Hyde and his trained grizzly, Adam, demonstrated just how powerful a bear's sense of smell is. Troy has raised and trained grizzlies for 10 years. We're going to do a little smell test with the grizzly. And what we're going to do is we're going to put some bait out across this valley and see if the grizzly can detect it with the smell alone and go to it. Troy has his assistant place the target about a half a mile away, behind a grove of aspens completely out of sight from Adam. Once the chicken scent gets into the mountain air, Adam has no problem picking it up. He's actually got his lip down, and he's sucking air in through his lips. He's taken the wind in through his, his sinuses and through his brain. He can pick out what that is and sort it out. He's sucking it in. In no time, Adam has determined the location of the target and is on the move in its direction. Adam has no problem finding the chicken and Troy believes his olfactory range is much farther than the half mile he's just traveled. Well, I believe he could, he could probably smell three to four miles out if the wind was in his favor. So if Adam can smell food three or four miles away, this means that a short-faced bear, armed with a better smelling mechanism and operating in open country, might be able to find a carcass within a six mile radius. But taking possession of a carcass wasn't just as simple as finding it. Usually there was another apex predator connected to the kill. I imagine in the Pleistocene, many aggressive encounters between carnivores, actual all out fighting. If the short faced bear found a dead bison, 
he most likely would be confronted by a group of saber-toothed cats feeding on the carcass. It would be size against numbers. The cats would stand and fight because of their advantage of three to one. Their long teeth also presented something of an obstacle. Let's remember that this is still a bear. It still has a massive, strong skull. It still has powerful limbs and feet that could swat at a cat and keep it at bay. Since most animals won't fight to the death, the experts agree on this fight's eventual outcome. If the bear got in one good swipe and, and really debilitated one of the saber-toothed cats, they would probably retreat. Or in other words, the bear would kick the cat's butt. This kind of confrontation might explain why the short-faced bear evolved into such a large creature. Sometimes it didn't even have to fight for its food. Its mere presence was enough to scare off a predator from a freshly killed carcass. But what happened when the bear was late for dinner? Like today's lions in the African Serengeti, no matter how fast the bear tracked down a carcass, other predators would have already eaten the animal's prime parts. It would be difficult for this massive carnivore to survive on the remains of a carcass that was essentially just skin and bones. This is where the bear's short face came in most handy, because its front teeth were so close to the fulcrum of its jaw, the bear's bite could crack open bones. Imagine this pliers is a face, like a jaw, going up and down, and this is the fulcrum of the lever system. If you picture the anterior teeth trying to bite bone or anything else, you can see that there's not very much power in that bite. The anterior teeth aren't very strong. I'm trying to squeeze that very hard, and I'm having no effect on that bone. Now, if we put it back closer to the fulcrum, we're going to see that there's much more power in that bite. The bear's short face gave its jaw the ability to crack open very large bones and access nutritious marrow cavities that contained fats, lipids, and extra calories. There is a large collection of 10,000-year-old bones that testify to the bear's skill as a scavenger. This is a very large bison bone from the Pleistocene. It was a large male. And this is the size bone that only a short-faced bear could have opened up. Dr. Paul Matthews is convinced the short-faced bear was a super scavenger. It could find nourishment in almost any carcass, even if that carcass belonged to another predator. Those feet, they're bigger than a softball mitt, and they got great big daggers on the end of it. He could probably rip you in half with one blow. Some experts believe that while the short-faced bear didn't actively hunt prey animals, it was still king of the beasts. But there was another dangerous predator who appeared on the landscape, human beings. These creatures had the skills not only to hunt mammoths, but intelligence enough to kill almost any animal. Scientists are still investigating the relationship between humans and the short-faced bear. Dr. Eileen Johnson is the director of the Lubbock Lake Landmark in Texas. She's renowned for analyzing alterations to bone surfaces. She's been examining some short-faced bear bones that were butchered by humans. It is the only evidence we have of human-bear contact. I've looked at all the bear remains that we have, and particularly the kinds of cut marks that are on the bone. And that leads me to uh, believe that, that this was not a fresh carcass. This carcass had already started to stiffen a bit, which would indicate a found carcass, which then indicates scavenging activities. Dr. Johnson feels the bear wasn't killed by humans. This is the, the canine from the bear, uh, but it's very worn down. So this is most likely a very old bear, probably died from natural causes. 
Ironically, it seems the humans may have found the bear carcass and then scavenged it. The hunters cut off one of the bear's long front legs and made a butchering tool out of its radius, or lower arm bone. Dr. Johnson was able to reconstruct how the bone was broken. The hunters laid it between two rocks that were like anvils. Then a hammer stone was used to break the bone. And it delivers a very quick, very focused force. Uh, you get a nice impact, and then the bone breaks in a very particular fashion known as a helical fracture. Since humans only had a few small stone tools, this was an ingenious and efficient way for them to butcher the giant bear or any other large animal, such as a mammoth. The broken edge of the bone provided a sharp and strong cutting tool that got the job done quickly. When the hunters were done butchering, they discarded the bone so they didn't have to carry around a lot of heavy tools. They would just make new tools at the next kill site. So it would lighten their load. It would limit the need to have a, an extended uh, tool kit. But hunters did carry one item that was essential for survival, the Clovis point. This was a stone weapon that was one of the first technologies invented by humankind. It was discovered in 1932 next to a dead mammoth in Clovis, New Mexico. Later, scientists were able to carbon date the mammoth bones, estimating the age of the spearhead as 13,500 years old. The Clovis point was such an important hunting tool that anthropologists dubbed the prehistoric Native American culture who used it Clovis people. These hunters specialized in taking down mammoths, and they were very good at it. Paleontologists discovered one site in southern Arizona where at least nine mammoths had been killed. But butchering a massive mammoth carcass would attract unwanted attention from a creature used to taking any carcass it found. If he smells a fresh kill, he's going to go for it. If there's a few funny-looking people around, that's not going to intimidate him. He's going to try to intimidate them usually by standing up and giving a display of his size. But while the humans couldn't match the bear's strength, they did carry a lethal weapon that could protect them from any fierce predator. The atlatl dart, armed with a Clovis point. The atlatl was humankind's first mechanical invention. It was a stick with a hook or socket that a hunter used to launch a light spear armed with a Clovis point. This is a replica Clovis point. It's very sharp, and with a lot of power behind it, it's easily going to penetrate the bear's skin. When thrown properly, an atlatl dart traveled at 100 miles per hour and was very accurate at close range. Still, Dr. Agenbrod feels it would have to be a very lucky shot. The hunters would have to aim for the vital organs that offered the most vulnerable target. Behind the bear's rib cage were its lungs, heart, and liver. You don't want to try hitting this animal in the head. You're going to be bear food if you do that. But who would have won this fight? In my opinion, Clovis people were very intelligent. They're using the very best tool material. They've invented a spear point that is a killing machine and you're going to try to dispatch him. You don't want to be in direct competition with this bear because you're going to lose. These are people who are trained from their youngest time. They're trained with their weapons, so I think that they are capable of defending themselves. While the results of human-bear conflict aren't certain, there is one undeniable fact. 10,000 years ago in North America, the mega beasts suddenly went extinct. This event is unprecedented and unexplained. Along with the short-faced bear, the dire wolf, lion, mammoth, sloth, and saber-toothed cat were wiped off the face of the earth. The short-faced bear was the last to die out. 
Without conclusive evidence, scientists are still grappling with the reasons for this mass extinction. Currently, there are a number of popular theories. One is overkill by humans. I think the prime extinction method for Pleistocene megafauna was by human hunting. The only really new element in the environment at about 11 to 12,000 years ago is the arrival of human hunters that we call Clovis people. Scientists have identified 14 kill sites in the United States where humans slaughtered mammoths or mastodons. But there is disagreement on the significance of this number. Many experts feel 14 sites is too few to prove overkill. There's also another thought that's been proposed that when humans come in, one of the first things they do is they kill off predators. Predators potentially prey on the humans, and so you get rid of them. No evidence has been discovered that humans killed even one short-faced bear, saber-toothed cat, or dire wolf. Just the fact that humans are in the landscape isn't compelling enough evidence to say that it's humans that causes extinction. We know that humans and these large animals coexisted in other places on the, on the planet for a long time, and it didn't lead to their extinction. It is hard to imagine that a modest human population could have emptied an entire continent of its megafauna. This leads to the one factor that could be common to such a vast area, weather. 17,000 years ago, North America witnessed rapid climate changes. A new theory suggests a comet collision was responsible. Some scientists believe there was a cold snap between about 12,900 and 11,500 years ago. This partial return to freezing ice age conditions put enormous stress on the ecosystem. We can tell from the isotopic analysis of the junipers that plants were greatly stressed. They weren't providing very much in the way of food, so there wouldn't have been very many herbivores. And in turn, there wouldn't have been that many carnivores. But detractors, again, point to a lack of evidence. Where are the deposits of starved or frozen animals that would be left behind had there been such a sudden climate swing? And how is it that the megafauna managed to survive numerous other glaciations during the prior two million years, only to succumb to the one that closed the Ice Age? So what happened to the short-faced bear? Dr. Paul Matthews favors a scenario where climate change caused the large prey animals such as mammoths and sloths to go extinct. This in turn caused the large carnivores that preyed on them to die out. Once they were gone, these predators weren't producing carcasses on the landscape for the short-faced bear to track down and steal. So eventually, you had such a low density of carcasses on the landscape that short-faced bears could no longer make a viable living. Lacking the adaptability to find other food sources and being solely a meat eater, the short-faced bear died out. Interestingly, its relative, the grizzly bear, had to struggle with the same climate changes, yet it survived. Today, the North American grizzly, like Adam here, has the same abilities as his ancestors did 20,000 years ago. Grizzly bears can find food just about anywhere. They have the nose to find it. They're an omnivore. And so they can find those different food sources, which has allowed them to exist today. As we walked through the forest with Adam, the entire area was like a supermarket for him. The grizzly has the ability to find food anywhere, starting with the bugs and slugs that live under the rocks. One of the things you saw the grizzly use his body weight as he got low to pull the rocks back. You also saw him, when he couldn't move them backward, you saw him shove them forward, and he was in a rocking motion to loosen those rocks up to get them out. Plus, he has the brains and brawn to obtain hard-to-reach food sources. No matter if it's in a mountain stream or up in a tree.
Unlike the short-faced bear, the grizzly has evolved in its ability to adapt to its surroundings. Although it prefers a vegetarian diet, the bear learned how to kill elk and deer in the lower 48 states, using short bursts of speed to surprise and blitz the animal. I think the grizzly bear took the short-faced bear's spot. Once the short-faced bear became extinct, I think the grizzly bear stepped right in there as our apex predator. It is believed that the short-faced bear lived on the planet for close to one million years. It finally slipped into extinction because it simply could not roll with the environmental punches that came with the end of the Ice Age. But today, thanks to innovative research, we can understand why the bear ruled our planet for so long. It could travel long distances using smooth locomotion. It possessed powerful jaws and sharp claws that could savage almost any animal. The bear dominated its world. Nature gave it all the skills it needed to maintain that dominance. But then nature decided to change and the bear could not change along with it. As the Earth's new rulers, we just might learn something from this vanished and mighty predecessor.